Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome back to another session of uh, research and publication ethics. And in last class, we have discussed scientific misconduct in Unit Two, Seven A lecture. And now this in a uh, second unit, scientific conduct, we are going to finish the remaining part. And today we're gonna discuss redundant publication, duplicate and overlapping publications, leaving slicing, and uh, selecting reporting and misinterpretation of data so these two topic we're gonna cover in this so let me put some light on this there may be instances where uh, you have written one article or maybe when you are working on your PhD thesis or MPhil uh, you publish one paper which cover your most of the part of your research work and then what you do uh, in second paper third paper you just uh, take the same paper and take some part of the same paper and get it published. So that would be a kind of duplication of a publication, duplication of a research. And uh, there may be instances beside this duplication of work that whatever result, whatever analysis you have made, whatever output outcome you are going to give, that may not be according to your expectation so you don't want to disclose that information that is also not uh, not uh, ethically right so that we will discuss and very very important thing that will come under selective reporting next thing is that when you think of uh, data uh, sometime data represents something but if you dig more you will be able to understand the data represents something but the reality is something else i hope you understand and I will show you some video where you can understand that data is saying something but uh, there is some something hidden if you uh, take care of that also then definitely the interpretation or output or outcome of the data or the analysis would be different so welcome back uh, to this session so this is lecture 7b and we have been talking about unit 2 and this is in scientific conduct, redundant publication, and selecting reporting and mis misinterpreting interpretation of data. And after this, the next lecture would be eighth lecture, and that would be unit three. So welcome back, and let me continue with the uh, redundant publication. Uh, according to Springer Publishers, uh, redundant publication it also described as semi publishing. This refers to the situation that one study is split into several parts. So you have one uh, full paper and then you divide into several parts. Maybe uh, your research, generally this happens. At first we write full paper, then we divide into small, small. It may be instances that you have done CFA, EFA, then review of literature, and then you use some other for example in CFA also you have divided into different different parts split it into several parts and submitted it to two or more journals or the findings have been previously been published elsewhere without proper cross referring permission or justification that is a kind of your own self plagiarism is considered a form of redundant publication so it's a kind of duplication of your work it concerns uh, recycling or borrowing content from previous work without citation. This practice is widespread and might be unintentional. Uh, transparency by the author on the use of previous published work usually provide the necessary information to make an assessment on whether it is deliberate or unintentional. So make sure that whenever you are conducting a research, uh, First, you start with a uh, review of literature, that's okay, you send it for publication. But when you use same data, right, you collected once a data, you are using uh, different, different techniques, and these are linked with one technique only, or the sub part of the technique, if you send it for a publication, that will come under that. What you need to do, you just use full technique, like CFA, right? discriminant analysis everything and then send it for a publication it cannot be like you divide it into uh, you are going for first reliability the alpha value then send it for a publication because uh, alpha value or the reliability would be also a part of cfa so you cannot divide it into a three or four different part and then send it to different, different places with same data 
same data you have collected. So let me show you before we uh, proceed further. Here this time I have added some references also for your reference so that you can read whenever you have time. But before that let me show you one uh, uh, video on this. Authors have an obligation to make sure their paper is based on original, never before published, research. Intentionally submitting or resubmitting work for duplicate publication is considered a breach of publishing ethics. Simultaneous submission occurs when a person submits a paper to different publications at the same time, which can result in more than one journal publishing that particular paper. Duplicate or multiple publication occurs when two or more papers, without full cross-reference, share essentially the same hypotheses, data, discussion points, and or conclusions. This can occur in varying degrees including literal duplication, partial but substantial duplication, or even duplication by paraphrasing. One of the main reasons duplicate publication of original research is considered unethical is that it can result in inadvertent double counting or inappropriate weighting of the results of a single study, which distorts the available evidence. There are certain situations in which the publishers of two journals might agree in advance to use the duplicate work. These include combined editorials, such as a plagiarism case involving the two journals, clinical guidelines, position statements, and translations of articles, provided that prior approval has been granted by the first publisher, and that full and prominent disclosure of its original source is given at the time of submission. The main rule of thumb is that articles submitted for publication must be original and must not have been submitted to any other publication. At the time of submission, authors must disclose any details of related papers, also when in a different language, similar papers in press and translations. The slicing of research that would form one meaningful paper into several different papers is called salami publication or salami slicing. Unlike duplicate publication, which involves reporting the exact same data in two or more publications, salami slicing involves breaking up or segmenting a large study into two or more publications. These segments are referred to as slices of a study. As a general rule, as long as the slices of a broken up study share the same hypotheses, population, and methods, this is not acceptable practice. The same slice should never be published more than once. The reason, according to the U.S. Office of Research Integrity, salami slicing can result in a distortion of the literature by leading unsuspecting readers to believe that data presented in each salami slice is derived from a different subject sample. This not only skews the scientific database, but it creates repetition that wastes readers' time as well as the time of editors and reviewers, who must handle each paper separately. Further, it unfairly inflates the author's citation record. There are instances where data from large clinical trials and epidemiological studies cannot be published simultaneously or are such that they address different and distinct questions with multiple and unrelated endpoints. In these cases, it is legitimate to describe important outcomes of the studies separately. However, each paper should clearly define its hypothesis and be presented as one section of a much larger study. In summary, duplicate publication and salami slicing are unacceptable practices and should be avoided at all costs as it can give an unfair advantage to some scientists. By increasing the number of publications they can list on their resume, scientists and researchers can progress faster in their careers or receive more funding than they actually merit. Additionally, salami slicing also leads to a waste of time for readers and reviewers as they have to go through repetitive content. It also leads to distortion of scientific literature. So this video was showing uh, different ways of redundant publication or duplication of a publication. So it may be in slicing form that yes, you divide your whole study into different into slicing with the same data and send it for publication. So that would be a kind of uh, unethical practices. So let me move further and let me put some light on. Uh, so here we have this references in terms of text you can read and video 
about redundant publication and next video a uh, next uh, topic we're gonna cover selecting reporting generally what happens as I mentioned earlier if you feel that this outcome is not as per my expectation and this research uh, analysis is not as per my uh, expectation or my prediction or prediction or expectation by or the opinion of people then what you do you want to hide that information you don't want to disclose this information and uh, you want to you 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 become very selective uh, and what you do you select few things in your, from your research and send it for publication because that would be more acceptable and that would be, be reflecting on what uh, review of literature is supporting so that is something which we need it's a kind of caveat that as a researcher it's our duty to disclose the reality and we should proceed further to come close to the actual reality so but uh, in, in many cases you might have noticed that that is not possible so people what they do they become very selective and uh, select few things which may be acceptable to the journal may be acceptable to the society may be uh, supported with the review of literature so here you can see the definition of selecting reporting bias selecting reporting bias is when results from scientific research are deliberately not fully or accurately reported uh, let me read out for reported in order to suppress negative or undesirable findings the result the end result is that the findings are not reproducible because they have been skewed by the bias during the analysis of uh, writing stages so what you did is squeeze something which you feel uh, is not uh, desirable right and which may be a negative uh, to to your outcome or maybe to the society maybe to the environment so that you suppress and suppress and that would be undesirable so you remove it and you become very selective selective report is one type of bias which undermines undermines the integrity of academic research it is a large contributor to the current reproducibility crisis fa facing scientific publishing so let me put more light on this here we have i have few video let me show you to all and i hope this will help let's move on to selective reporting um, and let's in the way talk about the elephant is there in the room selective reporting is important and many people still ignore the issue and it's one of the root cause of the current rep replicability crisis we are facing not only in biomedical sciences in the social sciences but it's clear that it's also happening in other types of sciences and this is with some exaggeration how it might work we all know that positive results are wonderful they're really wonderful we love them we love them so much that hardly any negative results are being published anymore. Uh, and why is that? It is because they bring us high impact publications and they get a lot of citations, uh, good for our years indexes and so on. And uh, if you're lucky, you get a lot of media attention with your public uh, a positive findings, especially when they are quite spectacular. And all these three goodies, they bring you the next grant and hopefully in the end tenure as an uh, academic professor. Now, in a cynical way, the good news is that cutting corners and worse uh, aspects of FFP and, and questionable research practices can help you to get positive results. In fact, that's their only purpose. purpose. They're wonderful tools in the toolkit to bring you positive results. And the pressure from your personal interest and sometimes also your sponsor interest make you utilize these tools, these forbidden tools, to get positive results because they're so wonderful. And then these positive results are often false. And because they're false, they're not that easily reproducible. That's basically in a simple way the story. And this is one of my favorite slides. I, I dwell a few minutes on it. It's, it's, it's really wonderful because it's so rare that you can see five randomized clinical trials on drug treatments for depression. They compare the real stuff to a placebo drug. Um, and this is at the FDA level. 
the Food and Drug Administration in North America. Uh, the FDA, they don't look at papers, they don't read papers, they look at data and they analyze data. So they ignore all the stories people are telling about the data, they look at the data and they analyze them for it themselves. And their judgment is, that is the gold standard judgment in this story, is that about half of these trials are positive in the sense that the real drug works better than the placebo and the other one is negative in the sense that there are no differences. So this is how it, reality is. Now when you look at this cohort of 105 randomized clinical trials, a few years down the line, you see that with one exception, all the positive trials have been published and only half of the negative trials. This is the first distortion. We call that publication bias. Normally, we only see this. Normally, we don't have that. That is why this is such a wonderful example. But it gets worse, worse. When you look more closely at the papers, it seems that some of the negative papers are written down as whether they were positive. The FDA say this is a negative study. The paper says this is a positive study. And why is that? The answer is cherry picking. Outcome reporting bias. In a trial, you have also always many outcomes. When you ignore the negative ones and polish the positive ones and present only these in the publication, you get a wonderful positive story for a negative study. But it gets worse. There is also a thing called spin. We have all these funny words. I have a beautiful paper in my, my laptop explaining 105 ways to make you feel good about a non-statistically significant result. There was a significant trend. It was almost significant. There was a clear trend and so on and so forth. We call that spin, using words to tone down the negativity of a study and to upgrade the positivity of a study. And there, these are the yellow, the yellow spots. So the, many of these negative studies, they're polished after, after the cherry picking and hardly any negative studies are left. And when you take one more step, the step of the citation bias, the selective citation, uh, my last two PhD students uh, uh, did their PhD degree on selective citation. One of them will defend the thesis tomorrow. And they found that positive studies are cited three to five times more likely than negative studies. Well, we knew that already because that's the reason we publish these positive studies. And that's the reason journals love positive studies so much. But what you see then is that the green bullets, they grow in the citation uh, uh, oeuvre and the, 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 the rare uh, uh, red ones left, they shrink. And when you compare this column to that column, you see what's happening. It's not a valid track record we see in the literature. And this is an example where we know it, like in many drug trials, but normally we don't know it. We don't have a clue because we don't have this column at all. So that's the reason I think that selective reporting is this elephant in the room. So this was an explanation of selecting reporting by Taylor and Francis group. Thank you very much, uh, Taylor and Francis, for making us realize that uh, okay, uh, when we, you know, squeeze the uh, negative study, uh, generally this happens. We don't like negative study, or we don't like uh, uh, our hypothesis not to be rejected. So this is something which comes under selective reporting. And now let us move further and discuss misrepresentation of data. Here you can see very, very simple thing. Uh, it, it's about uh, interpretation of statistical data. It's an uh, interpretation of analysis and representing data or information incorrectly, improperly or false. So th th there may be instances where you, you, you develop an association relationship or impact between two or more variables but these the interpretation of outcome maybe in terms of association or relationship 
uh, or maybe in terms of impact uh, may show you some result but there may be something which may be hidden and that some something may put some kind of impact on these two uh, variables so th maybe uh, we can talk about mediator uh, we can talk about moderator variable mediating variable and moderator variable and there may be other variable which we can discuss which really control and put some impact on your uh, on your variables maybe dependent variables or maybe independent variables so that variable which is somewhere hidden and impacting on your dependent and independent variable that we need to consider and that we need to calculate in terms of mediating variable or a moderator variable and that if you bring that if you consider it that will be proper correct information correct representation of data so uh, let me give you one more uh, presentation which i have taken घर पे अर्बन कंपनी बुलाओ सेफ हैकर करवाओ एट जस्ट रुपीज टू फोर्टी स्टेटिस्टिक्स आर परसुएसिव सो मच सो दैट पीपल ऑर्गेनाइजेशन एंड होप बेस सम ऑफ देर मोस्ट इंपोर्टेंट एनी सेट ऑफ स्टेटिस्टिक्स माइट हैव समथिंग लर्किंग इन साइड इट समथिंग दैट कैन टर्न द रिजल्ट कंप्लीटली अपसाइड डाउन For example, imagine you need to choose between two hospitals for an elderly relative surgery. Out of each hospital's last 1000 patients, 900 survived at hospital A, while only 800 survived at hospital B. So it looks like hospital A is the better choice. But before you make your decision, remember that not all patients arrive at the hospital with the same level of health. And if we divide each hospital's last 1000 patients into those who arrived in good health and those who arrived in poor health, the picture starts to look very different. Hospital A had only 100 patients who arrived in poor health, of which 30 survived. But hospital B had 400, and they were able to save 210. So hospital B is the better choice for patients who arrive at hospital in poor health with a survival rate of 52.5%. And what if your relative's health is good when she arrives at the hospital? Strangely enough, hospital B is still the better choice with a survival rate of over 98%. So how can hospital A have a better overall survival rate if hospital B has better survival rates for patients in each of the two groups? What we've stumbled upon is a case of Simpson's paradox. where the same set of data can appear to show opposite trends depending on how it's grouped. This often occurs when aggregated data hides a conditional variable, sometimes known as a lurking variable, which is a hidden additional factor that significantly influences results. Here, the hidden factor is the relative proportion of patients who arrive in good or poor health. Simpson's paradox isn't just a hypothetical scenario. It pops up from time to time in the real world, sometimes in important contexts. One study in the UK appeared to show that smokers had a higher survival rate than non-smokers over a 20-year time period. That is, until dividing the participants by age group showed that the non-smokers were significantly older on average and thus more likely to die during the trial period, precisely because they were living longer in general. Here the age groups are the lurking variable and are vital to correctly interpret the data. In another example, an analysis of Florida's death penalty cases seemed to reveal no racial disparity in sentencing between black and white defendants convicted of murder. But dividing the cases by the race of the victim told a different story. In either situation, black defendants were more likely to be sentenced to death. The slightly higher overall sentencing rate for white defendants was due to the fact that cases with white victims were more likely to elicit a death sentence than cases where the victim was black, and most murders occurred between people of the same race. So how do we avoid falling for the paradox? Unfortunately, there is no one-size-fits-all answer. Data can be grouped and divided in any number of ways. and overall numbers may sometimes give a more accurate picture 
than data divided into misleading or arbitrary categories. All we can do is carefully study the actual situations the statistics describe and consider whether lurking variables may be present. Otherwise, we leave ourselves vulnerable to those who would use data to manipulate others and promote their own agendas. So this video represents how you can interpret the data analysis uh, or you can misrepresent the data because here hidden variable or lurking variable may impact uh, on your in, uh, indirect or direct uh, dependent or independent variables. So that is misrepresentation of data. Uh, if you want to read more this here I have more text and video you can see in future for further reference. So this is all about this lecture today and now in next lecture uh, we'll go for that would be lecture 8 so we'll start with unit 3 and that would be about publication ethics and what content we will be discussing in that so we'll talk about publication ethics best practices conflict of interest publication misconduct violation of public publication ethics identification of publication misconduct and predatory channels thank you very much for today and we'll continue in the next lecture with lecture 8, unit 3. Thank you very much, everybody.